This week the Torah speaks about the building of the Mishkan. The building of the Mishkan is about bringing the presence of the Creator to dwell within humanity. Originally there was no need for a Mishkan. We already have a Mishkan. Each one of us has a Mishkan. But when the individual Mishkan was violated when the individual Mishkan was not properly appreciated when the individual Mishkan was no longer enough motivation for us to worship the Creator so we had to create a collective Mishkan a collective Mishkan that's going to be a metaphor, a metaphor that we're going to make so powerful through belief that the actual presence will be felt by all those who visit. And this presence depended directly on belief. In the time of the first Besamikdash, this presence was there could be felt, could be experienced by all who came. And in the time of the second Besamekdash, this presence was no longer there. And depending on the level of the Kohen Godel, all the different rituals, all the sacrifices were either acceptable to the source, meaning they had a spiritual impact as was intended, or sometimes the rituals were meaningless, or maybe even worse than meaningless, offensive to the source, to the purpose, to the spirit that we are trying to please. So the collective Mishkan is built according to specific measurements. The measurements remind us, represent for us, the measurements that were measured for our own experience. We are measured beings. We have limits. This was designed on purpose. This is why we have a body that has a specific shape and a specific size and a specific number of organs and specific functions. This is what makes this place special, is the limits that it has. And these limits are expressed in the Mishkan. The limits are the limits of the spirit, the formula for the spirit, in order to present itself within matter within the physical. The inspiration, the demonstration that the spirit can reside within the physical is every single human soul that is alive within a body. When a soul is alive within a body, this is proof that the spiritual can reside within the physical. And so now we're going to create a mishkan, we're going to create a collective template that demonstrates how this relationship, how this coexistence needs to take place. And so the goal of the entire Mishkan, the goal of the Beis Amikdash, the goal of all the different Kalim, is that in the Kodesh HaKedoshim, behind the Peroiches, the two Kruvim that are on the Kapiris should face each other with love, should embrace each other. This is the goal of the entire worship, the entire setup. And this means that in order for the spiritual to reside within the physical, there are many different 
forms of development, there are many different rituals that are necessary in order to keep the spirit involved in the spirit, in the physical, in a healthy way. So that this relationship is a successful relationship, is a fruitful relationship, is a relationship that brings joy. And the ultimate test of how we're going to know if the relationship between the spiritual and the physical is successful is if we're going to see the masculine energies and the feminine energies within creation unite with each other, bind with each other with love. And so the relationship between the male and the female within the individual, within each organ, within the spirit and the body, which are also in the form of male and female. All these relationships are indications of the healthiness of the spirit as it resides in the matter. The healthiness of the relationship between the spiritual and the physical. Wherever the the feminine and the masculine are not getting along, there is a deterioration within the relationship between the spiritual and the physical. The spiritual relationship with the physical cannot be healthy when the feminine and the masculine energies are not vibrating in a way that is complementary to each other. And therefore, everything that relates to building this dwelling place has to be done with devotion. The place, the motivation from where it would be appropriate to give something to help create this dwelling place has to come from the individual heart. If the heart is not doing it, if the donation is coming from any other interest, then this is going to destroy the dwelling place. This is not going to enhance the dwelling place. What we're looking for is a dwelling place for the spiritual. The spiritual is the one that knows what's in your heart. And so what's in the heart is what's going to count, whether we can contribute to creating this dwelling place. And once it was brought to, once it was donated to the Beis HaMikdash, Betzalel was the one who would make the kalim, would make all the different tools that were necessary to do the service. And he knew each tool, how it was represented in the body and how it was represented in the spirit, in the spirit that lives inside the body. This is why it says, Betzalel would know how to combine the letters that created heaven and earth. He understood the process of the creation of heaven and earth because the creation of heaven and earth is the exact same relationship as the creation of a human being, as creating a spirit and a body. And so therefore, the Mishkan also represents the original creation, which means the human being represents the original creation. They're all the same thing. They all represent the same thing. They represent a desire from an infinite one to become finite, to become measured, to become something that has limitations. And these limitations are marked. They're marked within our perception. Naturally, we know these limitations. If, for whatever reason, we were distracted from life, 
or we lived in an environment where we didn't develop appropriately, or for whatever reason we violate these limitations, eventually we're going to feel that we violated these limitations. And this is going to be an invitation to return within our natural limits. Just like we have physical limits, we have emotional limits, we have spiritual limits, we have limits of how we can interact with, with life, and it's acceptable to us, it's acceptable to our soul, it feels comfortable within our body, and we're, if we leave the limits, somehow we're going to know about it, because there's something inside of us that's been measuring. So everything is, with number, everything is in perfect order. Because it's so massive, because it's so complex, because there are trillions upon trillions of things happening, it's hard for us to see the order. It's hard for us to understand, it's hard for us to relate. But nevertheless, the fact that it works proves to us the perfection of the order. The order is there. The order is making it work. And this order has a way of how it works. It has a way of how it doesn't work. And it's very subtle. It's very smart. The nefesh is very wise. It knows exactly what it wants and what it doesn't want, even if it can't say it. It will still feel the results, even if it can't explain why. And that's because the spiritual and the physical have that relationship. The relationship is a real relationship. The relationship is happening all the time. The relationship is what's causing what's going to happen in our personal lives. The relationship is what's causing how we're going to react to what happens in our personal lives. And as a result of all our reactions, we're going to have what's going to happen in the collective. And then the collective is going to react. And then the individuals are going to react. And then together, there's movement within the collective, and so it goes. And so from when the world was created, the only purpose was so that the source can become present within creation. Creation is about something bigger than our individual lives. Creation is about a purpose that has to do with the source. The source is at least as important as the eight billion of us. We're preparing something for that. We are that. We were never something else. We have ideas about other things, but those ideas are not us. We are nobody. Nobody that's here to serve. No one. But not in the sense that it's really no one, in the sense that in the world of words there's no one. There's no representation of who we are serving in the world of words. And we have a big identity in the world of words, but that identity is not real. We're not that. Who are we? We are Him. We're serving Him. We're a part of Him. We're a purpose that we cannot define. So we are nobody serving no one. And yet, we're everything serving the most important. And because 
words have a very tricky nature, these opposite statements can be true because we're not relating to the world of words. We're relating to reality. The Mishkan is to remind us that there is the possibility that within a human body, the source can awaken. This is the purpose. This is why we need to have it now. People have forgotten who they are and what they're here to serve. Now we're going to have a reminder. All of us together at least are going to remember. If each one of us cannot remember, all of us together are going to remember. But then what, what happens? when the situation gets so bad that all of us together can't remember. What happens if what one single person could understand as a basic assumption, now even all the wise men in the world together cannot realize through all their wisdom. And this is not a theoretical what happens this is something that happened. And the result was, if all of us together cannot remember, then having a Mishkan, having a Besamikdash is no longer serving us. It's no longer a good thing that we feel secure and rely on something that we don't even understand what it means. That's not going to help us. That's going to fool us. It's going to make us feel safe when in reality we're very not safe. And so in such a circumstance, the safest thing to do is to destroy the Mishkan, is to destroy the Beis HaMikdash. Why? Because it only came to serve the spirit, the collective human spirit. Now, if it's being used as a way of giving refuge to the cruel, giving refuge to those who don't care about reality, don't care about the truth, they simply feel like they have an in and therefore they're safe. So then, compassion says, let's take that security away. And so that's exactly what happened. First, there were warnings, many warnings. Warnings trying to resuscitate the collective, at least. So that together we can remember that a human being has a bigger destiny than simply surviving the day. We are here because something very big is going to happen here. We're preparing for something. We're preparing for someone. We're becoming someone. We need to remember this. And so the prophets would go out time and time again and warn the people. If you don't remember your purpose, if you don't remember the nature of the relationship between the spiritual and the physical, the spiritual is going to become offended. And then you're not going to enjoy not the spiritual and not the physical. You're going to lose all your pleasures because you're too obsessed with certain pleasures. But when even that was not enough, the next best thing was Chorben Beis HaMikdash. At least let's take it away and let's face the reality that we don't know how to manage the relationship between the spiritual and the physical. Let's make that clear to everyone. May all the nations know that even Claudius Yisrael has forgotten how to manage the relationship between the spiritual and the physical. And therefore, if things are going wrong in the world, if there's a lot of fighting, if there's a lot of disease, 
if there's a lot of suffering, know that it's because the relationship between the spiritual and the physical has grown apart, has been broken. And now, wherever there is feminine energy and masculine energy, they're going to be in conflict. This is the nature of the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple is not simply relating to something external. The destruction of the temple means that we don't have the attributes that can allow for an appropriate relationship between the spiritual and the physical. The relationship between the spiritual and the physical is the model for all, for all relationships between the masculine and the feminine. And so this is the the underlying goal of all the commandments, all the mitzvahs that we do is the shame yichit kitchen brichishkinte to unite the masculine and the feminine divine, the forces that are responsible for everything that's taking place. Because if those two unite, if at the source they unite, then everywhere within reality they unite, everywhere within creation they unite. And this unification is the goal of creation. It's the purpose why humanity is here in the first place. Had Adam and Eve realized their relationship appropriately, then none of us would have gone through the suffering that we had to go through before we were going to discover the ultimate purpose. And so whenever we do something, we're combining the spiritual with the physical. Whenever we are doing a mitzvah, we are using perception, we're using intelligence to act within matter, to create within the physical. And thereby, we're bringing down the light from the world of thought, from the world of concept, into the world of matter, into the world of experience. And so, every mitzvah that we do is to unite the two worlds. When these, when these two worlds unite, when the world of perception and the world of experience, the world of feeling, the world of reaction unite, then everything in creation will unite because it's these same principles that are playing with each other in all these different scenarios. And so this is the goal of everything. The Mishkan was something that became necessary because we were falling. And then we fell so much more that the Mishkan became an obstacle until it had to be taken away. And then we fell so much more until we didn't even know anymore what having it and not having it actually means. We didn't even remember anymore what's the benefit of having it or why we should cry for not having it. And then we still kept falling. And forgetting. And identifying with the physical as if that's all we are. And making the temporary more important than the permanent. and forgetting the sacredness of the human spirit, the potential it has, the purpose. How careful we need to be 
not to offend it, not to cause damage, not to plant seeds of, seeds of evil within it. Until it became acceptable, even amongst people who claimed to believe, people who proclaimed the unity with their lips every morning and every night, and yet it became acceptable to cause damage to other spirits for very cheap reasons. For reasons that are meaningless even in the eyes of the one who is doing the damage. And that's only because the human spirit became cheap, the human spirit became meaningless, the human spirit became invisible. And that's only because we fell so far that we've forgotten who we are, that we've forgotten our own intelligence, that if we don't make the human spirit precious, then it's certainly not going to feel precious, even though it is very precious. As much as we might feel it's precious, we haven't even touched a little tiny inkling of its true potential and what it's really capable of. And not only that, even if it doesn't realize any of its potential, the power and the respect that it gets in the higher realms, in the worlds that create this world, all the angels in the world, in all the worlds that create this world, have so much respect for a human being that they would never touch it to hurt it, ever. Out of fear of the source from where they get life. All harm is always done by the demons. Demons are temporary beings that are created by us. They're the only ones who have the chutzpah to offend the human soul on purpose. No angel would ever do that. And the only reasons the demon could have the chutzpah to do that is because human beings did it first. It's because human beings are doing it that the demons can be created in this form, with this nature, with these types of behaviors. Had we respected the human soul the way that it deserves to be respected, not even the way that it deserves to be respected, one tiny drop of the way that it deserves to be respected, 1% of 1% of 1%. No demon would ever touch a human being ever again. They have no power, they have no rights. We have all the power, and we're using it wrong. And this is all because we've fallen so far, because we've forgotten. And this is why everything we do is Leman Yerushalayim. That the Baruch should return to Tzion. That there should be a unification of Tzion and Yerushalayim. That there should be a unification between the male and the female principle in all the worlds. And that will be evident by the presence that's going to return to Yerushalayim by the divine light, by the realization that's going to be available through Yerushalayim, by seeing not only us, but all the other nations turn towards Yerushalayim to look for the light of the Creator, the light of the Source that's alive in all the worlds. And this will happen when we remember. When we are worthy of a Mishkan, we will most certainly have a Mishkan. There will be no delay. No nation, no people, no force in any of the worlds will stand in the way of us getting a Beis Amikdash when we are worthy of having a Beis Amikdash. When we treat each other like a Beis Amikdash.
The whole Besamikdash is here to remind us how we should treat ourselves and each other. If we will remember first, if we will prepare to remember first, then the real Besamikdash is sure to come. That's been guaranteed. On that we don't have to work. On that, for that we don't have to worry. What we do have to worry is, how do we get to a place that we are worthy? How do we get to a place that at least we're not the one that's destroying the opportunity of today? So as soon as we find our way home, reality will take over. And then we'll be safe. We'll know we're safe. We'll feel safe. We'll remember we're safe. We'll feel more safe than we felt as children when we were in an environment that felt completely safe, when our body could still feel completely safe, when our mind could still feel safe, when we didn't even know yet how offensive the world can be. So may, all, may we all find the light that will unite us within all the different parts, all the different elements, and without all the relationships. We should heal our, heal our relationships. We should know how to interact with the human spirit in order to be kind and in order to create coexistence that feels the way that it was meant to feel. And we should be able to unite together as a people, as a nation, as a species, so that we can have more of what we already have. And this time, when we're going to have more, it's also going to feel right. May it happen soon. <laughs>